All right, well, welcome back. Welcome families of our students and guests to our fourth day of Senior Projects. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, congratulations to Ray and Jamie and Akemi for amazing presentations yesterday. <laughs> and for those of you who are new to the building, uh, bathrooms are out that door and down the hall. Everybody take a moment to silence your phones, please. Thank you. And we also want to acknowledge all of the people that have been watching on the live stream that we know of from Mexico, France, Costa Rica, Hungary, Belgium, Canada, Germany, and other parts of the US. So thank you and thank you for making that possible. Yeah. And now I'll turn it over to Senor Aguero. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. So guiding Anna in her senior project was a very enjoyable process. It is interesting because I had little interaction with her before starting this journey. In fact, I have never been Anna's teacher. As many of you know, in high school she took Germany instead eh, Germany, German, sorry, instead of Spanish. This fact did not stop Anna from looking for me and asking if I could be her senior project advisor, and I am so glad you did. I am not going to take much of your time because she has a lot to say today about her topic. I would say that it has been a great pleasure to get to know Anna and learn that she has a diverse range of experiences, qualities, and traits that make her a well-balanced and fulfilled individual. Those who are close to her know that she is very passionate and eloquent person with a deeply felt kindness. But also, she has a strong desire to know and learn new things. We explored different ideas together since the beginning of this process. And I admired how Anna had the courage to find the topic that would speak to her the most. And at the same time, she would make her her own. There was so many awe moments and so many interconnections on the way, which is just another reminder of the importance of being open, aware, to look around, and feel how connected to nature and our surrounding natural world we are. Even sometimes the waves of the lake can give us the answers that we're looking for. So please welcome Anna Istep. Often, do you sit and observe the morning dew on blades of grass? Have you ever noticed the hundreds of iridescent windows in a fly's eye? My name is Anna Estep, and some of my favorite pastimes include sitting in the grass, watching the different shapes of clouds as they pass overhead, counting the rings of age in a tree stump, or observing the brown, yellow, and gold leaves as they float down the river on a fall day. Back in 11th grade, I thought I wanted my senior project to be on the relationship between language and culture and how they interact with each other. Now, I could still do an entire senior project on such a fascinating topic, but as my advisor, Senora Aguero, can attest, I was called by shark skin and termite mounds. I was called by the innate curiosity within me 
to explore the natural world around me and the connection that humans have with nature. In my search for such a topic, I discovered a term that would encompass and fulfill these desires to get to know more about the natural world and sustainable design. This term is biomimicry. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the term, I will define it. For those of you who have heard it before but might not know what it is, I will go into an in-depth explanation of its principles and its history. I will then explore some specific cases of biomimicry that I think are vital to understanding its concept. I will conclude with some personal takeaways and a message of hope. Now, before I get into all of that, I would like to discuss the reason why I think biomimicry is so important in the world today. Over the course of several technological revolutions, humans have viewed the separation from nature as the highest ideal. From the Neolithic Revolution, or the first agricultural revolution, when hunter-gatherers began settling down and creating civilizations based on the planting of crops, to the scientific revolution, when humans began viewing nature as a machine rather than a living force, to the industrial revolution, when machine manufacturing replaced muscle labor, to the petrochemical revolution, where the drilling and exportation of oil began dominating the world, and lastly, to the genetic revolution, where scientists are now able to genetically modify human beings themselves. Over time, humans have developed easy transportation. We have made remedies for health ailments, protection from natural threats, and an economy that supports an entire system of people. We have grown so independent and self-sufficient that we equate ourselves nearly to gods. Yet we still depend on uncontaminated water, nutrient-rich food, and clean air in order to breathe. Through our own technological advancements, of which we are so proud, we are harming our own means of survival on this planet. We cut down entire forests, we drill and mine the earth for oil. We endanger entire species of animals. We plant one-type crops and inject chemicals into our food. We pollute the land, air, and water. We rely on finite, non-renewable resources and waste non-biodegradable materials that then go on to fill landfills, take up space on the earth, pollute the oceans and the air. In general, we as humans perceive ourselves as superior species over all other species on the planet. Despite the fact that large amounts of our population experience food insecurity, water scarcity, inadequate shelter, where we could once travel to new, uncharted land after ex exhausting the resources of one region, we now occupy every corner of the earth, and there is nowhere to fit our increasingly growing in po population. In comparison, nature's life forces keep each other in check. If foxes overfeed on rabbits, the rabbit population decreases, in turn causing the fox population de to decrease because of the lack of prey. And so, life is balanced. No one species is meant to exceed its limits by appropriating all of its resources. The unsustainable habits of humans are beginning to truly harm the planet. The solution is to relearn how to live in harmony with nature from nature itself. In other words, biomimicry. The term biomimicry is derived from the Greek word bios, meaning life, and mimesis, meaning imitation. Essentially, biomimicry is the emulation 
or imitation of the forms, processes, and ecosystems found in nature for the purpose of sustainable, life-conducive design. Over the past 3.8 billion years, life on Earth has evolved from bacteria to intricate, diverse, and efficient life organisms that coexist harmoniously within ecosystems. Some organisms can fly, others can glow in the dark, and yet others rely on the sun's energy to survive. Yet none other than humans rely on finite fossil fuels, generate waste and pollution, and exceed their limits by appropriating all of their resources. I would like to share a quote with you all from Janine Benyus, the co-founder of the Biomimicry Institute and the author of a book called Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. She says, a system that is far from stable is a system ripe for change. After the Neolithic, scientific, industrial, petrochemical, and genetic revolutions, we are facing yet another paradigm shift this time based not on what we can extract from nature, but we, what we can learn from it. With the use of advanced technologies, humans are able to study cells, discover stars, and even examine the human brain. Yet there is something ironic about this. The more we learn about nature with the aid of these human inventions, the more we realize that these human inventions pale in comparison to the ancient power of nature's quiet, profound intelligence. Chameleons and cuttlefish can camouflage themselves into their environments and hide in plain sight. Wood frogs can freeze themselves in winter in sub-zero Alaskan months and thaw back out in spring. Birds, humpback whales, and monarch butterflies can migrate south in the winter and north in the summer without any sort of physical navigation device. Ants can carry 10 to 50 times their body weight, the equivalent of an average human carrying a rhinoceros or a medium-sized SUV. Now, every, despite everything that makes these individual organisms different and unique, there are several ways in which they are all conducive to life. These ways have been organized and identified as nine principles which biomimics, or people who contribute to biomimicry, use as guidelines for sustainable, life-conducive innovation. These nine principles of biomimicry are as follows. Nature runs on sunlight. Nature uses only the energy it needs. Nature fits form to function. It rewards cooperation recycles everything, banks on diversity, demands local expertise, curbs excesses from within. Nature taps the power of the limits. Now I'd like to move on and discuss a brief history of biomimicry, seeing as how it's rather modern concept in the grand scheme of things, beginning with the basic biomimicry era of early observations where the invention of the umbrella was inspired by a giant lily leaf. Moving to the emergence of early biomimicry innovators with the likes of Leonardo da Vinci, who in the 15th century took extensive notes on bird flight and sketched models of flying machines based on the mechanisms of a bird's wing. And we also have the Wright brothers, who in the early 20th century successfully flew the first plane after allegedly observing vulture flight. Moving on to the emergence of, early, of modern biomimicry, were terms such as bionics, biomimetics, and biomimicry itself were coined. Lastly, we have the Cambrian explosion of biomimicry and research, 
which would be nothing without Janine Benyus. A biologist and self-proclaimed nat nature lover, Janine Benyus popularized the growing movement of biomimicry with her 1997 publication of the book, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. I read this book for my senior project and I highly encourage you all to flip through its pages, find something you find interesting. I've left it outside on my art installation for your benefit. Benyus has helped to organize organizations, journals, she has led conferences, and even training sessions for those interested in becoming biomimics themselves. Let's move on to talk about some specific cases of biomimicry, which I think are especially important when understanding what biomimicry actually is and its impact for the future of sustainability. Now, I'm sure most of you who have gone through hikes in the forest are familiar with this little brown friend who likes to accompany you back home on your clothes. <laughs> in 1941, George de Mestrel, a Swiss engineer and inventor, went out hunting with his dog and both came back covered in these burrs. De Mestrel examined them under a microscope and realized the potential for a strong adhesive material. He created two strips of fabric, one with hooks inspired by the hooked spikes of burrs and the other with loops inspired by the loops of clothing or dog's fur. He went on to found a company called Velcro, a word derived from the French word velour, meaning loop, and crochet, meaning hook. Now, a side note, because I'm still a language nerd, crochet hook, the little tool we like to use in the third grade at Waldorf, is just like saying hook, hook, similar to saying Miss Frau or Miss Senora. Demestral's invention of the hook and loop fastener has quickly gained popularity and now exists in households all over the world, helping cushions attach on to couches smoke detector, detectors onto walls. It helps fasten children's shoes and the sleeves of jackets. This Burr-inspired Velcro innovation is one of the first most fundamental examples of biomimicry. And when I say the word shark, thanks to Hollywood, the sensation probably instilled within you all is one of fear of this human predator. The beauty of sharks exists in their skin, which has inspired the, the invention of a bacteria repelling surface that has the potential to save lives. The story of this innovation begins with a material scientist named Dr. Anthony Brennan who was on a mission to create a surface material that would prevent algae and other living organisms, such as barnacles, from attaching onto the hull of ships. In his research, Dr. Brennan discovered that, unlike other deep sea, slow-moving creatures, the Galapagos basking shark remains somehow free of bacteria. Dr. Brennan was able to get his hands on the mold of a captured Galapagos basking shark and realized that its skin is in the shape of these diamond ridges. Dr. Brennan took the pattern of shark skin and impl implemented it into a surface material that proved 85% successful in keeping algae from attaching onto the hull of ships. Dr. Brennan went on to found a company that creates thin, adhesive-backed films that are inspired by the pattern of these shark skins. This film is bacteria repellent, and it is used to attach onto door handles or knobs, toilet flushers, handrails, really any surface that is considered the breeding spot for di disease. As you can imagine, this shark skin-inspired film is especially useful in hospitals, where the Center for Disease Control and Prevention estimates 100,000 patients die every year due to hospital-acquired infections. 
Now at a hospital, staff usually rid the surface with toxic chemicals, which bacteria can adjust to and form some sort of resistant to and exist despite the presence of the chemicals. The shark skin inspired film works because bacteria microbes are about three micrometers in size, while the spaces in between the shark skin inspired film pattern is two micrometers in size, preventing the bacteria microbes from attaching in the first place. Inspired by sharks, Dr. Anthony Brennan was able to create this bacteria repelling surface material that has the potential to save lives. Let's move on to my favorite realm of biomimicry, which is sustainable architecture inspired by nature. The largest two office building complex and shopping mall in Zimbabwe, called the Eastgate Center, is passively cooled, meaning it cools itself without the use of air conditioners. The architect who designed the Eastgate Center, Mike Pierce, believes firmly in a principle of biomimicry. Nature demands local expertise. Mike Pierce turned to native South African termite mounds as inspiration for designing the Eastgate Center. Using mud and saliva, termites build their mounds 30 feet in the air and use them to farm fungi for food. In order for these fungi to grow, the inside of the termite mounds must maintain a steady 86 degrees Fahrenheit, which is accomplished by the convection and permeation of airflow throughout. As you can see here, air flows into the side vents in the termite mounds, circulates, circulates around the base of the mounds where they, it adjusts the temperature of the earth. Then as the sun warms the sides of the termite mounds during the day, the air inside warms and rises up and it exits through the top of the mounds. This rising of air creates a vacuum which pulls in air from the sides and thus the convection cell continues, maintaining that 86 degrees Fahrenheit inside the mounds. Mike Pierce designed the Eastgate Center based off this passive cooling system of termite mounds. Low powered fans suck in air from the sides of the two buildings and vent the air upwards where it is absorbed and cooled by the cement walls, ceilings, and floors. Throughout the day, the, war the air warms and rises up where it is released out through these chimneys in the top of the roof. Again, this creates a vacuum that sucks in, helps suck in air from the side, and so the cycle continues. The Eastgate Center was also designed with brick and cement, two materials which imitate the insulation properties of mud that termites use for their mounds. Now, researchers have since realized that their previous assumption that termite mounds stay a steady 86 degrees Fahrenheit at all times is a bit much of an exaggeration. They've realized that instead, the termite mounds, the inside temperature fluctuates based on the outside temperature. But the strategy that was originally used as inspiration for the design of the, term of the uh, Eastgate Center remains effective. This two-building office complex in Zimbabwe remains 82 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and 57 degrees Fahrenheit at night without any money spent on air conditioning. The building cost 10% less money to build, resulting in cheaper space to rent inside. The Eastgate Center uses also 35% less energy than buildings of similar size, making it a global landmark for sustainability and energy savings. Let's move on to our next example of biomimicry. We always talk about how much CO2 humans emit into the atmosphere. But did you know there is a way to remove or sequester this CO2 from the air? 
Let me explain. Beginning with some background knowledge on the cement industry, which accounts for 8% of the world's total carbon emissions. When, carbon, when fossil fuels are burned, carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere, contributing to the greenhouse effect of global warming. By attracting and absorbing and trapping the, the heat from the sun's rays in the Earth's atmosphere. Now, cement, a powder-like substance, is created when limestone, mined from quarries, is crushed and mixed with other minerals at, a, at about 2,000 degrees Celsius. And for our American brains, about 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit. This crushing and mixing of minerals requires fossil fuels to be burned, releasing carbon dioxide as a byproduct. About one ton of carbon dioxide is released into the atmosphere per every one ton of cement produced. Dr. Brent Constance, a scientist and professor teaching biomineralization at Stanford University, invented a way to not only eliminate the emission of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere with the production of cement, but to use this greenhouse gas as a building block in the production of cement so as to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Allow me to introduce coral reefs. When carbon dioxide is dissolved in seawater, it is called carbonate. And when carbonate interacts with calcium in the oceans, the two bond to form a solid called calcium carbonate. This calcium carbonate solid is what forms coral reef skeletons. Dr. Constance realized that the same method that coral reefs use to grow can be the inspiration for carbon negative cement, where carbon dioxide is used to create the cement instead of only as an emitted byproduct. In 2007, Dr. Constance created a company called Calera Corporations that takes and uses the carbon dioxide emitted from the smokestacks in a power plant in Moss Landing, California, as you can see here on the right. Instead of mining limestone, this company creates its own by spraying seawater through 110-foot-tall vertical columns, and which catches the, the carbon dioxide in the smoke from the smokestacks of the power plant. The calcium in the seawater interacts with the carbon dioxide in the smoke, and the two bond, forming calcium carbonate, or limestone, which is then used to create the carbon-negative cement. If humans could replace the 4.4 billion tons of cement that, that we produce each year with carbon negative cement, we could reduce 20 billion tons of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere each year. Inspired by coral reefs, scientists have, are now able to retract from the atmosphere the carbon dioxide that we have been emitting since the Industrial Revolution. Widespread implementation of this method could be the right step forward in the direction towards a solution for climate change. I'm sure all of you have wondering, after we have discussed burr-inspired Velcro, shark skin-inspired bacteria-repelling surfaces, the termite mound-inspired passive cooling Eastgate Center, and carbon sequestering cement inspired by coral reefs, what is, what is the ultimate case of biomimicry? In my opinion, it is the imitation of life's biological cycle of nutrients in the creation of a circular economy where materials are reused and recycled instead of discarded after one-time use. In nature, Every form of life plays a role. Rabbits that eat plants are prey for foxes. When a fox dies, its carcass is eaten by a vulture. The remains of the fox's carcass is eaten by mushrooms, fungi, 
which converted into nutrients in the soil, which then provide food for the plants that grow, which feed the next rabbit. And so the cycle of nutrients continues. Each microbe in nature used and nothing considered a waste. While nature's ecosystems are grounded in this cycle of nutrients, humans, the vast majority of humans, interact with materials on a linear basis. We take and extract finite, non-renewable resources from the earth. We make something, usually emitting carbon dioxide in the process. And we discard, filling landfills with materials that decompose into microplastics and harm the animals in the ocean, contaminate our water sources, or release carbon dioxide or other toxins into the atmosphere, polluting the air. We even landfill that which belongs directly back in nature, such as Christmas trees, weeds, food. Essentially, we take, make, and discard. In my opinion, the ultimate goal of sustainability is biomimicry, where this circle of biological nutrients is imitated in the creation of a circular economy. I have here a visual representation of what I mean by a circular economy, beginning with far fewer raw materials are used. Materials are designed to be repurposed and recycled. The production and distribution of these materials accounts for far fewer emissions into the atmosphere. There is a cycle of consumption where materials are repaired and reused for as long as possible but before being deemed ready for reuse. Then they are collected and recycled where they are recycled into where they are repurposed into something new, causing far less residual waste. This, to me, is the ultimate case of biomimicry and that which, towards which all biomimics should work. Now, I could go on and on and on talking about my favorite examples of biomimicry as each one provides an exciting insight into a new innovation that you might have never thought of before, just as you wouldn't have thought of carbon sequestering cement when you see coral reefs or bacteria repelling surfaces when you see a shark. If you would like, please come find me afterwards. I love talking about biomimicry, and I would love to share with you the self-filling water bottle that was inspired by a Namib desert beetle, the humpback whale that inspired the creation of more aerodynamic wind turbines, or the slime mold that helps design cities. Through our advancements in technology and with the help of nature, humans are able to solve real world problems such as climate change and water scarcity. However, the human tendency towards greed and egotism can make it easy to forget the burr, the shark, the termite, and the coral reef that inspired us in the first place. In order to prevent this biomimetic revolution from becoming another industrial revolution where humans use nature to put themselves above nature, the call for change should be directed not towards technology, but towards human ideology. We should follow the footsteps of the indigenous peoples and replace our greed for power with a gratitude for the knowledge Mother Nature gives us. By humbling ourselves, we make room for respect for and awe of nature. Over the past few months researching biomimicry, I have arrived at several personal conclusions that are echoed by Janine Benyus in her book and that support the objective of biomimicry, which is to learn from nature instead of simply attracting from it, extracting from it. These conclusions follow a four-step course of action which promote and nurture the future of biomimicry as sustainable, life-conducive design. First and foremost, we should learn how to quiet the desire to solve everything by human cleverness 
instead immersing ourselves in nature. Nowadays, humans are forgetting how to find contentment simply by spending time in nature. The art of tree climbing, of skipping rocks, and watching the clouds pass by overhead is slowly fading, even in children. We should take the time to observe the morning dew on blades of grass, to notice the hundreds of iridescent windows in flies' eyes. We should nurture the deep natural connection that humans have with nature through observation and wonder. Secondly, we should develop a curiosity for the world around us. With the constant availability of search engines to answer our every question, we lose the sense of wonder that is instilled by actual provoked thought. We should remember what it's like to be curious about forms of life, from humpback whales to hummingbirds to mushrooms and jellyfish, bats, weeping willow trees. We should want to learn how these individual organisms interact with each other to create harmonious ecosystems. Thirdly, we should imitate the forms, processes, and ecosystems found in nature for the purpose of sustainability and life, life conducivity. Biomimicry is an interdisciplinary field that C combines and unites all other fields of science, from biology, chemistry, architecture, engineering, mathematics, and computer science, all for the common goal of sustainable innovation. Lastly, we should preserve the diversity of life through humility, respect, gratitude, and conservational stewarding. For the past few hundred years in America, 95% of all virgin forests have been cut down. Prairie land has been cultivated. 60% of all wetlands have been drained and filled. And half of all ecosystems have been degraded to the point of endangerment. Now we must use these resources for our survival, but the, the solution comes with an understanding of how to use these resources and how many of them to use, maintaining a respect for them, for those resources that we do use. And I want you all to close your eyes and imagine this. The future of biomimicry is a world in which energy is harvested from the sun and wind, Farms are pest resistant and naturally self fertilized. Materials are manufactured to be biodegradable. Society runs on a circular economy that promotes the spare, that uses materials from the earth sparingly, that minimizes waste, and that uses very few carbon dioxide emissions into the atmosphere. Humans treat nature with respect, dignity, and gratitude. Biomimicry is more than just a field of study. It's a way of life. Now open your eyes to a reality where this ideal future of biomimicry seems far away. The journey there requires the change of human ideology. It only takes hope, wonder, and curiosity. The next time you are up with the morning sun, take the time to observe those morning dewdrops on blades of grass. The next time you are irked by the buzzing of a fly, take the time to notice the hundreds of iridescent windows in its eyes. There lie the secrets to life. Thank you.
So I have some thank yous, uh, beginning with Senora Aguero, who, as many of you might know, picks up every single piece of trash he sees on all of our long walks to the beach and around the neighborhood, and I can never thank you enough for that. It always inspires hope in me. I'm never gonna forget that gleeful moment by the lake where we observed the water washing up and telling us what to do. <laughs> and. I can't thank you enough for all the time that you have dedicated towards me, all your willingness to hear all of my ideas and to support my changes <laughs> in ideas. Um, yeah, and just all the rehearsal time you dedicated towards me. I couldn't thank you enough. To Ms. Hasebegovic <laughs> for using the word paradigm so many times that I had to go home, look it up, and actually use it in the first sentence of my paper. To Ms. Rogers for that pivotal talk in the bathroom. And to my parents for teaching me to develop my own personal viewpoint based on the information that I gather, not simply ingesting everything that I hear around me. And a special shout out to my dad for being that constant annoying voice in my head as I write my paper. Do you really mean what you're saying? <laughs> to Avla and Akemi for getting me through that senior project writing block with solitaire, jokes, benting, and jazz music. To Rudy for being my constant motivation late into the night. <laughs> to Leticia and Quinn watching from Germany and Benji watching from Belgium. You guys are the best. To my class sponsors for supporting this entire thing, working so, so, so hard to make it possible for all of us to get up here on stage and present what we're passionate about and for being the best class sponsors we could ever wish for. And of course, to my class, I could not be more proud of all of you guys and I'm excited to see what the rest of the year brings us. Thank you. Great job, Anna. Great job. Questions? Questions? Yeah. Uh, that was so good. Um, how am I going to follow that up? <laughs> we'll do amazing, Nia. Thanks for the vote of confidence. Yeah. I got you. <laughs> Are you going to like share this with the rest of like the world? <laughs> <laughs> uh, my hope is to bring that wonder of nature into every room that I enter. Um, so yeah, to the rest of the world, I don't know, but to, to everyone I meet, yes. Anna, I have a question in the back. Hi. Hi, fantastic job, you did a, a great, um, a great job of uh, presenting and storytelling, um, and it's inspirational. I worry that if in a capitalist society where we're driven by profit, do you think that this can work, or is someone just gonna grab some idea of mimicry and just like, this is how we make money on it, and we exploit, once again, some natural resource to the point of extinction or endangerment? Yeah, that is a serious concern that I addressed a bit. I'm talking about how we're trying to keep from this like biomimetic revolution from turning into another industrial revolution where we're, you know, exploring, ex, ex, um, ex, exploiting. Yep, uh, the, the the inspiration that we find in nature um, for our own benefit and for profit, um, and. I think it's very idealistic of me to be so hopeful um, 
but I think also there are two ways you could look at it. Um, you can be a pessimist and like worry about that, and I think it, like that's a genuine concern. Um, but as long as we have hope and we keep finding that love for nature, I think the the connection with nature can bring us back to what is most important and um, yeah, to remind us of why we're alive. Hi, Anna. Uh, first of all, that was TED Talk worthy, not just <laughs> TEDx, but the real TED TED. Uh, I pay to see it. My question for you was, if we're not engineers or scientists, how can we imbue the principles of biomimicry in our day-to-day -day lives? Um, I mean, there are a few that are kind of more broad than others. Um, especially like nature fits form to function, talking about how like we shouldn't overdo what we're like, mm, it's hard to explain, but um, in, in the whole talking about like how humans exceed our limits, we're, we use everything and a lot of things of it. We like cement, put cement all over the, um, the ground and, um, we basically take over the world, um, and I think following nature, we could just do what we need and what is necessary in order to survive instead of like living in all this luxury and unnecessary trifling things. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic job. <laughs> I loved it. Phenomenal. So uh, I was talking to one of my friends the other day about uh, Earthship and how that could be used to, for sustainable living. Do you have uh, any comments on that? <laughs> I could do a whole another presentation on Earthship. This is what inspired me to actually find biomimicry in the first place. Um, yes, Earthship, basically, for those of you who don't know, Earthship is this off-the-grid, self-sustainable housing that provide like, and all the energy in Earthships is found, harvested from the sun, and all the water used in like plumbing, for drinking, for showering, flushing toilets, is collected from the rain. Um, and that would be the highest ideal of biomimicry. Um, that's kind of impossible in like modern urban society. Uh, but yeah, it, it's always fun to think that that exists and that humans really can live solely off of nature instead of exploiting these finite, non-renewable resources and fossil fuels and emitting carbon dioxide into the air. Uh, I, I have another question. Yeah. So uh, what do you think about like uh, humans eating genetically modified like uh, fruits and vegetables? I don't know much about that. Um, so I can't really say much. <laughs> um, I don't know, like just, I think it's always better to fix what we're doing wrong rather than try to like, like go back to what we originally had that was good than trying to like do other modifications to make it better. Um, so I think uh, nature will naturally like make self-fertilize and make your crops pest resistant just based on like um, the, the natural flow of, okay, this crop is gonna grow here and the next year it might die, but it'll come back. And so that like cycle um, comes naturally and I think those foods are the most full of nutrients um, to eat and they also promote um, the cycle of nutrients in life and are best for nature um, and so like making our own food or like genetically modifying our own food could lead to even more separation from nature, which is against the ideal that we're trying to, like biomimicry is promoting. Great job. Like no words. Um, <laughs> but are other people, um, like how widespread is biomimicry? Like other cement people, are they, using the ideas of that into their own, yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
I don't think biomimicry is very well known, um, but the amount of companies that I've come across that promote biomimicry or their, their first website is like biomimicry or like we are inspired by this thing in nature is kind of inspiring to me because I didn't know that so many companies actually care about nature and like um, using or like tur at least at least turning to nature for inspiration. Maybe they don't, don't really care about nature, but um, <laughs> um, all I have to say is there's a website called Ask Nature. Um, I recommend it for anybody. It's basically this website where if you plug in any sort of like keyword like mushroom or tree or um, like cement even, you can, uh, what pops up is a bunch of strategies for biomimicry um, and th that can lead you to companies that have used that strategy or to ways in which that strategy could be implemented. Um, so it's not as widespread. I didn't even look like worldwide. Um, so all I know is around America and people who are um, inspired by Janine Benyus. But yeah, there are multiple foundations online that have to do with biomimicry. There's the Learn Biomimicry, Biomimicry Institute, Biomimicry 3.8. So yeah, it's, it's a growing movement. <laughs> okay, last question over here. When you were a kid, like, did you like play a lot like in your backyard or like with like, you know, dirt and stuff? Absolutely. Uh, one of my favorite parts about growing up would be going in the forest and building like shelters out of logs and branches. And then when I got into Waldorf school, um, my favorite part was going to the beach and building fairy houses. And then I go to camp and spend weeks in the wilderness and um, yeah, interact with nature. So I would love to say that nature is a huge part of my life and has been since I was a kid. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being a great audience. Uh, we'll be back and we'll start our next presentation at 11 a.m. So take a break and see you later.
Welcome back. I know it was a quite um, short break, but thank you for being back here. And we are ready to listen to our second presentation of the day. So please welcome Mr. Paulson. Hello, everyone. When I was 17, I had an extraordinary opportunity to go to Costa Rica. And I was in the rainforest being led on a tour by a guide. And at some point, he said to those of us in the group, shh, everyone stop. Look up in the tree. And you'll see a quetzal. The national bird of Costa Rica, one of the most beautiful birds that you can catch sight of in the wild. I imagine working with Nia as an advisee a little bit like looking for a quetzal in the rainforest at night and hoping to catch a flash of those colors by moonlight. And I did. And I am so thrilled that you are about to share in what Nia has created for her senior project. One thing that is worth noting, and I think this fits in line with the presentation we were all just treated to, is that the Quetzal is nearing an endangered species. And we are all endangered species. And in the face of that reality, the challenge to us all is, do you lean into life and light and get caught by the beams that show your colors? Or do you lean into the alternative? And Nia's graphic novel and the creation of it, the story that she chose to adapt, they're an exploration of that challenge. So please give your utmost attention to Nia Diaz-Perez. Uh, is my slideshow gonna show up? Thank you. <laughs> Um, I'm Nia, and first I want to ask you guys if you think the world is ending. I mean, Anna gave you a couple of reasons in her presentation at the beginning, um, like it is at least a little bit. Global temperatures inc have increased at a rate of 0 0.11 Fahrenheit since 1970. The population poverty has increased by 5% in the past year alone. Brutal wars rage across the ocean, and it feels like there's nothing we can do to stop any of this. I mean, the ruin is creeping in. The end is nigh. Uh, before I get into my project, I do talk about suicide, uh, brief mentions of drug use, and this does revolve around the apocalypse. A uh, party at the end of the world is the title of my graphic novel adaptation of the short story, The End of the End of Everything, written by Dale Bailey. It's published in 2014 in a collection of short stories, um, but I found a version free online. And I connected with this morbid tale of staged suicides and murder in the face of an impending and inevitable apocalypse. The story's evocative language is consumed with doom and angst and conjured visual imagery, which I could easily picture as a graphic novel. Set in the near future of a wealthy artist colony somewhere on a craggy bluff overlooking the Pacific Ocean, this upper echelon of society engages in suicide parties as the end of the world slowly encroaches upon them. They've paid for this escape, and they may be the only people left in the apocalypse called the ruin, a general decay that takes over people, homes, and the environment, causing everything to die, wither, and turn to dust. In a seemingly futile attempt to overcome their impending doom, the characters try to escape the apocalypse by engaging in suicide parties, killing themselves before the apocalypse arrives. The story begins as we follow Ben, a writer who does not write, and his wife of many years, Lois, who's an accountant. 
as they arrive and are introduced to this isolated, extremist society of hedonism, nihilism, and wealth. Ben and his wife are middle-class people invited by Ben's college buddy Stan to the colony. Stan, a prominent action movie star who left his wife pre-apocalypse for a much younger co-star, represents everything Ben is not. Ben and Lois naively understand themselves as mere visitors to the colony, and Ben fantasizes about a wild life of writing achievements that he's too cowardly to pursue, even in the face of impending doom. On the night of their arrival, they attend the first of many suicide parties where an Italian film director throws himself off a cliff into a rocky coastline below. Lois is appalled and says that this is no place for a child despite the child's death being as near as anyone else's. She believes the child deserves to die an innocent. Veronica Glass is known as the mutilation artist and leads a reclusive life uh, in the colony. She embodies the nihilistic isolation, hedonism, and sadistically cruel culture of their world. Her art entails performances of dissections of those colonists unable to bring themselves to commit suicide. She further memorializes her performance pieces by preserving their body parts. The installation piece I made is kind of inspired by something that she would create. Um, and a significant part of the story is Veronica trying to convince Ben to let her murder him in one of her performances, as his weakness of character makes him a prime target for her. Um, when writing, I had to work to extract the necessary scenes. Uh, the criteria for scene selection was how inspired I was to like create a uh, picture of it. Um, I didn't have a storyboard, I just kind of just sketched everything as it came to my mind. Um, here's like the original line art that I scanned in. Um, originally, I was going to color it on my computer in like a vector style, but about like five pages in, uh, it corrupted, like the colors got lightened in that way and I uh, could not change them back. Uh, but it was kind of a blessing in disguise. Uh, moving forward, I used um, an iPad and Procreate, uh, which allowed me to have just more fun when creating this. Um, when designing Veronica, I used lots of angles to create like an animalistic and predatory face. Her close-up eyes and sharp cheekbones should make her look like a carnivore. And for Lois, Ben's wife, I use curves to create a docile look. She's a kind and gentle soul with a body as sturdy as her morals. For Stan and Ben, the two male characters, I wanted them to reflect each other. Ben is thin and hunched over while Stan is broad-shouldered and muscular, where Ben has weak stubble, Stan has a full beard. For Mackenzie, Stan's younger wife, I drew her so that you couldn't see her eyes. Um, for most of the story, Mackenzie is a glamorous object to be ogled. Uh, ideally, when I do reveal her eyes, it's at a moment when her humanity is revealed. She's resigned to her fate and how people perceive her. She's not thinking of making some big statement through suicide. Unlike Lois, she doesn't protect her child from the reality of their inevitable demise. While everyone else wants to be taken out with a bang, she will fade slowly. Um, an important part of drawing was color and shape communication. Uh, I know certain colors elicit certain feelings. Shapes have the same effect. Uh, for example, darkness is commonly sharp angles with bright colors like yellow and red, while sadness, on the other hand, tends to be monochromatic with darker and saturated colors. Round shapes are inviting and comforting, while square shapes signal sturdiness. These are important things to keep in mind when creating visual art of any nature. Um, I'm often inspired to use color palettes from photos or paintings I like. Um, when drawing the monochromatic walk on the beach, I took the colors uh, basically directly from this picture because, well, monochromatic palettes are hard to eyeball. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the writing contains impactful imagery that I enjoyed translating into a visual medium. Uh, I'm going to read out some quotes that inspired certain images within my comic. This was a still living place. 
They could hear the distant sigh of breakers beyond the house, an enormous edifice of stacked stone with single-story wings sweeping onto either side of the driveway. The sharp tang of the ocean leavened the air. Gulls screamed in the distance, and it was summer and it was evening, and in the cool dusk, the declining sun made red splashes on the narrow windows of the house. Down here, that salty tang was stronger, and a cool wind poured in off the water. The sea gleamed like the rippling hide of some living behemoth in the moonlight. The sand seemed to glow beneath their feet. Everything was precious, lovely in its impermanence, for what was not now imperiled. He dumped their baggage in an untidy pile just inside the door and ushered them into a blazing three-story glass atrium. It leaned rakishly over the dark, heaving water, more sense than seen, and Ben, as always, felt a brief wave of vertigo, a premonition that the whole house might at any moment slide over the cliff and plummet to the rocky white beach below. Now, I don't really think the process is the interesting part, uh, but I needed to pad the runtime. Uh, I think art exists to communicate. With known to communicate to, I think the character's art becomes meaningless to them. Because there will no longer be anyone to appreciate their art, killing themselves feels like the only thing that they can do, otherwise they believe their life will lose meaning. Veronica Glass is the only artist who truly reflects the deep pain and nihilism prevalent in this society, and her gruesome tactics only highlight how little is left. Their art can no longer be the significant part of themselves, at least not anymore, as their purpose is seemingly lost. Most of the artists aren't, or at least aren't anymore, connected to their craft from a place of love. They are sellouts whose art is about spectacle, salaciousness, and shock. They are an action movie star who left his wife for a younger woman, a movie director who throws himself off a cliff, a creative writer who slits her wrists before she can ever finish her book. The main character is a writer who doesn't produce work, and the only artist of any importance dissects living people live. They have been living meaningless lives. They have distant families, shallow friends, big empty houses, and a stockpile of drugs. Now that the end of the world is so close, they don't know how to cope, nor how to make their lives meaningful with no time left. Their most authentic engagement with the world is now their acts of suicide. The world is desensitized to all else, but simultaneously these acts are an expression of their collective pain. The impetus for the suicide of these characters emerges from a deep inner emptiness, simultaneously a resignation of their fate while selfishly reclaiming their autonomy through their public send-offs. I feel like we're at the end of the world in some ways. Seemingly everything has lost its meaning and we enjoy exploitative media while simu simultaneously being desensitized to horrific things that are happening in the world right now. Imagining creating art that speaks to any current emotions, fears, and desires is incredibly daunting. One fear is making statements too obvious and coming off as trite, but to create art without a message, feeling, or an idea feels like creating little at all. To create something without a will behind it, without a pulse for creation, is impossible. I imagine the artists in this story have lost their pulse. All disgustingly wealthy, their impetus for making art has become solely financial. They've become soulless. And without a population to extract money from, they have no deeper reason to create anymore. This is why they die. Because of them, it feels like there is no more reason to make anything. I disagree with their philosophy wholeheartedly. Art is communication, as I said. We are all social creatures. What we do, we do with the hope of connecting. To live in such difficult and unprecedented times is even more of a reason to make art. We must learn to express the emotional nuances of our everyday lives. We are living in an ever more isolated time, in loneliness epidemic, and still wrestling with a year of isolation. I don't think painting pictures of people with masks on is enough to represent this period in history. These complicated feelings can only be handled with equally complicated art, and it should be created as much as possible. To see anything that resonates with you emotionally is a small step out of loneliness, and to make, and to make it is a giant one. Even if you feel like no one is listening, I still think it's important to express oneself. At the end of the world, we need to reach out and create. We shouldn't die because we can't create. We should create because otherwise we'll die. Thank you.
Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, I want to say thank you to uh, my parents, especially my mom, for supporting me through all of this. I want to say thank you to Mr. Jeanette and Mr. Paulson for helping me through different uh, parts of my senior project. I want to say thank you to my class for you know, being my friends and stuff. <laughs> um, I want to thank all of my teachers as well, just for like helping me kind of love school again. Uh, and I think that's it. Thank you. Um, questions? Uh, I just want to say, I, one, I love how I can feel the pages, how I can feel like the texture of them and like the colors. And uh, where can I get this? <laughs> what? Where, where can I get this? Like, is this an actual? Oh, yeah. Um, you can get, it's pretty short. You can get it for like $2. I have a couple things. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, my question is that what sparked you to do this comic? Like, what in your mind seemed like, oh, I want to do this? Like, did you get it from when you were asleep? Like, did you have a dream about it? Or did you just had it popped in your mind and you just wanted to just let it out? Um, it's based on a short story. Uh, but the reason I make comics is for a reason that a lot of professional comic artists don't like. Um, like, I kind of make them because I can't make movies, uh, which a lot of comic artists uh, say is a really bad opinion. You know, comics shouldn't just be lesser movies, but that's why I do them. Uh, okay, so I wanted to ask, so you adapted this short story into a comic, and I want to know that, first of all, with the story, and I guess to a larger extent with the comic, what do you want your readers to take away from this? What do you want your readers to think as they're reading the pages? What emotions, what ideas do you want them to? Um, I mean, I just want them to think it looks nice. Uh, and that, and to not be like uh, internet nihilists, you know? Yeah, I got it. <laughs> I just wanted to ask what you're planning to do after high school, and also have you contacted the author of the short story? Um, I'm going to SAIC next year. <laughs> um, uh, and I think I'm going to email him like a couple of the pages and be like, hey, I liked your short story. I made this. Do you like it? Um, hi again. Do you actually think suicide can be hedonistic? Do you actually think suicide can be positive or performance art or something to be, uh, or does it have virtue? Um, not in this story. I don't think they're committing. I don't think a suicide is, uh, it's a complicated topic, obviously. Um, I don't have any like negative feelings towards those who commit suicide, uh, but it's not like a, a positive action by any means, you know, it is ultimately the stifling of life. Uh, and in any sense, that's a tragedy. More? So uh, this is more so of a statement rather than a qu no, 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 <laughs> I got both. So um, I really enjoyed uh, reading the comic because of the images. And uh, do you think, uh, like, how much time did you spend into picking the colors and the, like, contrast in the images? And uh, how, do you think that does a good job of representing the story? 
I mean, only I can't be the judge of how well it represents the story, really, because uh, it's my I'm the one kind of making the interpretation. Uh, I spent probably too long working on it. Uh, my mom was getting kind of uh, stressed about how long I was taking to finish it. Um, but I think it's, uh, I think color is probably my favorite part of uh, creating any art, uh, especially having really vibrant uh, colors and good contrast. Um, again, you can find the graphic novel in the exhibition hall along with the installation piece that Nia created for this. Unless there are no other questions, thank you again, Nia. back at 12.55 for our next presentation.
please find your seat. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you had a tasty lunch. Please make sure that all of your electronic devices are silenced or turned off. And then for people who are just joining us and are unfamiliar with the building, uh, the bathrooms are out this door down this hallway down that way. Okay, all right, I will begin the first introduction of the afternoon. And I will say that one of the best parts of being a teacher in the high school is that you get to watch your students grow throughout the entire process and change. And of course, that is true for our friend Rudy. Um, <laughs> When I first met Rudy, he, I would say that the more humorous, light-sided, uh, jokey side was probably the more apparent. That was his outward projection, I think, to the world. Um, and the serious side of Rudy was in there. It was there, uh, but maybe suppressed as, as often with uh, ninth graders and 10th graders. Yeah, where are you? But, uh, but as over time, it's been really fun to see, uh, to, to see Rudy kind of blossom and explore his interests and kind of feel really comfortable with, um, you know, looking into the things that he's interested in and taking his studies more or letting that seriousness blossom to the surface. And uh, occasionally even his jokes are kind of funny now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but so it is this this his project uh, where he's going to talk to you about uh, physics and space and kind of the evolution of uh, these subjects over time where he does take on a, a pretty complex and technically complex subject and um, make it relatable and understandable uh, and something that he really likes. Um, something that he's really interested in. And so it's, it's really, I'm really happy and excited to be able to present Rudy Luzietti uh, to come give his uh, presentation on space. Hello everyone, my name is Rudy Luzetti, and welcome to my senior project, Falling Into Place. My senior project is the culmination of my learning about my passion subject. I spent the better part of my life being intrigued by outer space, and now I have the perfect platform to show you all my love. When I was in fourth grade, I found a book on the reader shelf. The book enticed me with its cover, and once I started reading, I couldn't let go. The pictures in the book were so filled with color, and it was a revelation to 11-year-old me. So needless to say, I stole the book. And I showed it off to my parents, and I exclaimed, I want to be a scientist. And as time went on, I began to learn more and more, and soon realized that space's beauty doesn't only come from pictures. And up until a couple of days ago, that's all I would have said on stage. Now this story is completely true. I still have the books to this day, but what this doesn't include is my most recent discovery of myself. I like watching stuff break, well, being pushed to the limits. 
My project is on the evolution of thinking regarding the nature of, u of the universe through physics and how the understanding of the people is constantly being pushed to their limits. We're going to start off with the early signs from ancient Greece and make our way to classical mechanics and Einstein. And then we're going to discuss gravity and how physics pushes gravity to its limits. Fuck it. Uh, Aristotle was a polymath in ancient Greece. Oh, Aristotle was a polymath in ancient Greece around 350 BCE. And despite being famous for being a philosopher, Aristotle talked frequently about natural philosophy or physics. It's important to talk about ancient Greece because it laid the foundation for what was to come. Physics in ancient times was mainly based on logic. For example, Aristotle observed that no objects move without cause. He believed that objects made out of elements, earth and water, were brought toward the center of the universe, which for Aristotle meant the center of the earth, showing that he believed in the geocentric model. And after Aristotle came Copernicus. Copernicus was a polymath in, in the Renaissance who made the heliocentric model overtake the geocentric. This places the sun at the center of the universe, and after Copernicus came Galileo. He was the first to use a telescope to observe the sky. He found mountains on the moon, rings on Saturn, and Jupiter's four largest moons. However, Galileo's most famous experiment was when he tested Aristotle's idea that objects fell to the Earth at a speed proportional to their mass. He dropped objects of varying sizes off the Leaning Tower of Pisa and discovered that they fell at the same speed, disproving Aristotle's ideas that heavier objects fall faster. And another fan, a main physicist and astronomer I feel obligated to talk about is Johannes Kepler. Kepler was known for studying the orbits of the planets and discovering that they are elliptical rather than circular. And using the work of these physicists before him, Newton created calculus and overhauled physics. Newton published his three universal laws of motion in 1687, the first being inertia. Inertia states that an object at rest and an object uh, must remain at rest and an object in motion must remain in motion at a constant speed and in a straight line unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. This is Newton's most famous law. And it's basically saying that objects will remain in their current state of motion unless acted upon. For example, if you were to throw a ball in the air, that ball would fly forever if not acted upon by the external factors that Earth has. It could be raining, windy, or the gravitational force due to Earth will bring the ball back down to the ground. Or if a pen is thrown in the deep vacuum of space, it will move at a constant speed at which it was thrown indefinitely until something acts upon it. Next, we have Newton's second law. And this law defines force as equal to change in momentum per change in time. And since acceleration is equal to change in velocity per change in time, that makes force equals mass times acceleration. This allows the force required to displace to be measured and calculated along with finding the force that was used to displace. Newton's third law is action and reaction. And this law states that whenever one object exerts a force on a second object, the second object exerts an equal and opposite force on the first. Newton is essentially saying that forces are due to interactions between objects. For example, when a bird pushes its wings down, air is pushed down underneath the wing. And at the same time, the air pushes the bird upwards as a reaction to the air being pushed down. In other words, the force of the bird is pushing down on its wing, and that creates an equal force that propels the bird upwards. And next, we have Newton's universal law of gravitation. Newton's universal law of gravitation states that every particle attracts every other particle in the universe with force directly proportional to the product of the masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Using this equation shown here, which says that gravitational force is calculated using the products of the masses of two bodies divided by the square of the distances between the bodies, multiplied by the universal gravitational constant. This provided a highly accurate and simple way to calculate gravitational force. In fact, it was Newton's equations that were used over Einstein to get humans to the moon. The work of Newton was made possible by thousands of years of study before him, and his work made physics boom in productivity. Nobody has ever seen such a simple way to describe physics. However, in the extremes, the classical mechanics of, New of Newton breaks down. When, de when dealing with the supermassive and extremely small scale, something else is needed. That's where our friend Einstein comes in. He was born March 1879, in Germany, and in 1905, he published Special Relativity and 1915 General Relativity. Together, these two works are known as relativity. But what is relativity? Special Relativity focuses on everything besides gravity and acceleration, which General Relativity focuses on. To start, Einstein has two postulates for relativity. 
The first being that the laws of physics are the same for all observers and all, uniform, and all uniformly moving reference frames. The second is that the speed of light is the same for observers and all uniformly moving reference frames. The first postulate was already accepted by physicists and taken essentially as fact. However, the second was incredibly radical. This is because this postulate directly goes against Galileo's rules for relative motion. According to Galileo, to measure the relative speed of an object in motion with respect to another, one just has to add the two speeds together. For example, take a red car traveling on the highway at a constant speed of 50 kilometers per hour, and a different blue car traveling in the opposite direction at 60 kilometers per hour. According to the red car, the blue car would be traveling at 110 kilometers per hour. However, this is not true with light. Einstein is saying that light must travel at the same speed as long as it is in vacuum. This creates an exception to the already established and proven law. However, in 1926, an experiment took place. In this experiment, the speed of light was measured from a binary star pair in which one star was traveling away from Earth while the other was traveling toward Earth. According to Galileo, the speed of light would either be C plus the speed of the star traveling toward Earth or C minus the speed of the star traveling away from Earth. C would be the speed of light traveling at around 300 million meters per second in vacuum. However, this was not the case, and both light waves from their respective stars measured at the same speed, proving Einstein's second postulate to be true. And along with these two postulates, reference frames are used extensively in general relativity. And to visualize it, a reference frame is an observer's or object's point of view. An inertial reference frame is a reference frame in which observers or objects are in the state of an inertia. For example, if a pen was in deep space far enough away from all forces, that pen would be in an inertial reference frame. And using reference frames, Einstein talks about the thought experiments that he conceived, one of which was to help him find the nature of gravity. We can go through a similar thought experiment together to help us understand what Einstein wrote about in his theories of relativity. So let's take our friend Albert. Put him in a pod, deep space, far enough away so that everything, from everything, so that Albert is in an inertial reference frame. Albert would be able to float about his space pod freely, if not for the fact that Albert is accelerating. As the pod acceler accelerates, you cannot keep up with the, with the pod as it is traveling faster and faster, so Albert is stuck to the floor. If you were to jump, the accelerating pod would catch Albert in the air, and if Albert were to drop two balls from his hands, they would appear to fall from the flo floor. Does this situation feel familiar? It should, as this is an acceleration affecting Albert in the same way that gravity would. In fact, if Albert were to be accelerated at 9.8 meters per second squared, then the force that Albert would be experiencing in his pod would be identical to the force felt on Earth due to gravity. This shows the equivalence principle, and the equivalence principle shows that the force of gravity has the same effect as acceleration. Einstein goes very far with this idea, which brings us to our next topic in relativity, the nature of gravity in 4D space-time. Four-dimensional space-time is the model used to shape the world around us. We as humans normally think about dimensions as a width, depth, and heights, but time is also a dimension. Think of time as the ability to move. Nothing is instantaneous, and therefore time is required for anything to happen. Einstein proposed that gravity is not in force, and instead, it is a result of space-time curving to mass. And instead, instead of objects being attracted to other objects of a higher mass, space-time is curved due to the high amounts of mass which changes the natural path of objects to fall toward the object more curving space-time. A great way to think about this is imagining a layer across space in which mass imprints on this layer of space causing curvature in space-time. As one object get, goes closer to another massive object that significantly curves space-time, the path of the object in motion would fall toward the center of the indentation. These indentations in space-time are caused by matter, meaning all matter has some effect on space-time, no matter the matter, no matter the mass, no pun intended. As said by the famous theoretical physicist John Wheeler, uh, space-time tells matter how to move, matter spells, tells space-time how to curve. This, however, is an imperfect analogy. In space, there's not one plane as seen here. There's planes everywhere. They're stacked on top of each other. And a more accurate model would be this. In this, you can see how matter creates bends into the center of mass in every direction, creating a much more accurate depiction of space-time. In addition to this, photons and massless particles are affected by gravity. But how is this the case? This happens because electromagnetic radiation, or energy, is massless. However, mass can be turned into energy. Therefore, energy can be turned into mass. 
This happens using Einstein's most famous equation, E equals mc squared, where E stands for energy, while m is mass, and speed c is the speed of light, approximately 300 million meters per second. This means that very small amounts of mass can create extremely large amounts of energy. And due to this, extremely large amounts of energy are required to create even small indentations in space-time. However, because electromagnetic radiation is affected by gravity, it allows for many phenomena, one of which is gravitational lensing. Gravitational lensing takes place when light is bent by supermassive objects and is seen by the observer. This allows for objects to be seen even if they are completely covered by something else. This happens because the light is being let out in all directions from the observed object, and that light is heading in the direction away from the observer gets bent by curved spacetime. This happens in such a way that it appears next to the supermassive object. This is observed quite frequently through telescopes with galaxies, stars, and neutron stars. And if conditions are met, an Einstein ring can be seen. An Einstein ring is a ring of light from a body that is lensed around the supermassive object in such a way that it forms a perfect ring. Gravitational lensing is mainly observed when looking at galaxies on Earth, but it also happens at the event horizons of black holes. So now we have caught up to the present day. I want to take a moment to mention that all of the work of scientists from the past has helped scientists of today create impressive technology to continue humanity's quest to learn more about the universe. Now, I'm going to discuss some of these technological marvels and how we use them to learn more about the universe. Some examples include ground-based telescopes, space probes, space-based telescopes, and satellites. Black holes, for example, have been notoriously hard to observe, but through years of hard work and technological advances, humans have been able to learn a significant amount. Black holes have the strongest gravitational impact of any known object in the universe, so much so that nothing can escape its grasp, not even light. Black holes range in size, mass, and spin, and theoretical black holes can be smaller than atoms, while black holes at the center of galaxies can be thousands of light years in circumference. Black holes, like every other part of the li star's life cycle, have layers. The main way in which black holes are born is from supernova, the deaths of supermassive stars. When these stars die, they implode, and the mass of the star collapses in on itself, becoming more and more dense, ultimately forming a black hole. The accretion disk can be observed in this image. Oh, I don't hold on. And that is made up of matter that is being sucked into the black hole in such a way that it forms a disk. The accretion disk ranges in size, but it can get up to thousands of light years long. It's made up of anything that the black hole consumes, which can be planets, stars, neutron stars, and even other black holes. And next, we have the relativistic jets. These are astrophysical jets present at the poles of black holes, and these are made up of material that did not get consumed, originating from objects that fell into the black hole. In other words, these are beams of ionized matter being blasted away from the black hole at near light speed, and these MX can extend for thousands of light years. This is a fake one, this is an artist picture, but in this slide, you can actually see it like this. And this is a courtesy of Hubble, of course. And, um, and then getting closer to the center of the black hole, we have the photon sphere. This is a sphere of photons coming from the black hole's accretion disk or relativistic jets. These photons are being manipulated by the intense gravity of the singularity, so much so that they orbit the event horizon. Right outside of the photon sphere is usually where the innermost stable orbit lies, and that is the closest orbit of the singularity in which there's no risk of falling into the event horizon. And right after that, we have the event horizon, the point of no return. The event horizon is a circle around the black hole that signifies the point at which the light can no longer escape. And then finally, at the center of the black hole, we have the singularity, the point in which physics collapses and phase time falls apart. Because of this, there's no sense for the past, future, or present in the singularity as time is broken along with space. Everything that enters the event horizon will end up here, collapsing in further and further until it becomes infinitely dense. But does it? The idea of infinite density is a controversial one. Many scientists believe that singularities do exist, while others do not. Realistically speaking, infin infinity cannot exist within a finite space, and such singularities can't exist. 
However, according to relativity and logic, infinite density must exist to explain black holes. But how do these supermassive vacuum cleaners die? As you know, nothing is immortal, and black holes are no exception. Hawking radiation is what kills black holes. Hawking radiation is when a pair of a particle and an antiparticle are formed from the en energy of a black hole, and one half of the pair gets sucked into the black hole. And in order to annihilate the other half of the antiparticle pair, the black hole uses some of its energy to or mass to do so. Eventually, an unfed black hole will die, and all black holes, after time, will suffer the same fate. And a common question regarding black holes is, what happens when they collide? This is actually a quite common occurrence, and the, sing the singularities will merge, and one black hole will remain with the sum of the two masses. In doing so, they'll emit massive gravitational waves. As predicted in relativity, gravitational waves have been proving true using interferometers across the world to detect them. Gravitational waves are ripples or distortions in space-time caused by everything. Humans, cats, turtles, cars, bread. Even as I speak, I'm creating gravitational waves that will disrupt space and ripple throughout the universe. However, extreme events such as neutron stars colliding and mergers between black holes produce large enough gravitational waves to be observed. These travel at the speed of light, and the gravitational waves detected on Earth are all from events that happened hundreds of thousands to billions of years ago. Gravitational waves were first theorized in Einstein's theory of general relativity in 1915, and have only recently been discovered using LIGO and other interferometers on Earth. LIGO can detect gravitational waves when they hit Earth. LIGO stands for Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Detector. And LIGO consists of the two biggest interferometers ever built, one being in Hanford and the other being in Livingston. The, they're in interferometers, meaning they merge two or more light sources to create an interference pattern. An interference pattern is a pattern of marked and unmarked spots showing a pattern coming from wavelength. These patterns can be analyzed by scientists, and this is how information is gathered. From these interference patterns, the mass, size, and spins of black holes can be derived. In the case of LIGO, the interferometers are in the shapes of L's, and mirrors are placed at the ends of the arms to reflect light, making fringes. A laser shines into a beam splitter and hits the two mirrors placed on the ends of the L-shaped arms. Each of LIGO's arms is about four kilometers long, and they need to be that long in order to get as precise measurements as possible. The longer the distance that light travels, the smaller of change it can detect. LIGO can make observations and measure change in distance over a thousand times smaller than a proton. But why is this important? When light reflects off the mirror, it travels longer and longer distances, consequently making the total length traveled by the lasers longer. Gravitational waves are traveling through Earth, and they warp space-time while doing so. That warp space-time stretches out the distance of the path that the light has to take to make it through the tunnels. It does so to one of the tunnels first, causing the light to not reach the starting point at the same time, showing proof of space-time being warped. This is LIGO. And next, we have the James Webb Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope is another fascinating piece of technology that, along with LIGO, is leading the charge for modern-day physics. The James Webb Space Telescope has been capturing remarkable images using infrared, which can gather a lot more information that was previously locked behind technological limits. Although, because humans can't observe infrared light, the images need to be mapped out onto the visible spectrum. And one of its most recent discoveries was made public on February 22, 2024. James Webb captured the best evidence of a neutron star where a supernova occurred. It picked up high energy radiation, likely from a neutron star at the site of which a star recently collapsed on itself. The James Webb, they, James Webb Space Telescope is the most exciting piece of physics happening right now, as it provides incredible information to scientists, and it also shares the power to spread information and share information with the public. Its images are awe-inspiring, and they're a great tool to get people interested in space science and physics. This here is Neptune, as seen by the James Webb Space Telescope. And this one, you can very clearly see its rings, as, as well as the storms happening on Neptune. 
And next, this is Jupiter, as seen through the James Webb Space Telescope. This one is a really incredible image, because you can also see the rings of Jupiter. You can see its two auroras. And you can see the big red storm, which on this is blue because it's infrared. The colors need to be mapped out onto the visible spectrum, so it appears blue. This is usually red. And uh, this is an incredible image. This was not taken by the James Webb Space Telescope. This was taken by the Cassini probe that was launched in 1997, and it lasted up until 2015. And this was sent to take images and learn more about Saturn, which it did a fantastic job at until we plummeted it into Saturn so we could like, basically do satellite suicide so it didn't uh, hurt any of the moons of Saturn. And next, we have a globular cluster. Uh, this was taken by Hubble. And uh, this shows thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of stars. And this was also taken by Hubble. And this is uh, Messier 1, or the Crab Nebula. And a nebula uh, is basically it's the remnants of a supernova. It's one of the things that could be the remnants of a supernova. And um, it's like a star nursery. And here, uh, stars are born. And through observing them, we can learn more about star formation. And we can actually witness star formation. In fact, in, um, in, in the year 1040, a, a Chinese astronomer observed a, a guest star, which uh, was what he called it. But basically, he saw the supernova uh, through his naked eye. And it lasted in the sky for about two months. And it was so bright, it was even visible during the daytime. Next, we have the Ring Nebula, Messier 57. This is another nebula. Then Messier 42, Orion, courtesy of Hubble. Then we have the Sombrero Galaxy, also taken by Hubble. And this contains over 200 globular clusters. And this is the picture of Uranus as seen through the James Webb Space Telescope. And this, you can really see its rings. And this is the infamous James Webb Space Telescope. And um, oh, hold on. Uh, space science has an incredible future ahead of itself. Humans have had their thinking of the universe shift throughout the years. And with each passing day, people's thinking of the universe will, continu will continue to warp and shift as we discover more and more about the universe. With advancements in technology, people will only begin to become more and more curious as to what lies just out of reach. And as history has shown, we will continue to let that curiosity drive us and take us to new revelations. Voyager 1 is the first man-made object to leave the solar system in 1990. And after its primary mission of exploring Jupiter and Saturn, Voyager 1 turned around to take this picture, which Carl Sagan ironically called the pale blue dot. The pale blue dot is Earth. And, it, and this is an emotional symbol of, of how far we've come and how physics has changed over time. Uh, I hope all of you have learned, been inspired, or at least entertained by me. Uh, thank you. Oh, yeah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Oh, come on. Cup it up. Cup it up. Well, <laughs> what? Oh, hold on. <laughs> All right, so first I'm going to say my thank yous. I didn't really plan this out, even if I hinted that I did. No. But um, my biggest thank you is to Mr. Dr. Belagamba. Amazing person. Clap for us yeah. <laughs> He helped me at every step of the way. He made sure I was doing my work. He made sure the work was good, accurate, right, and just a phenomenal person. Uh, my next thank you, probably going to go to my family over there. Well, yeah, clap for them. I love you guys. You guys are awesome. Next, we're going to go down to the people on Zoom. Not you guys yet. Um, or on YouTube. Uh, we got Quinn from Germany, Sphere in school, and some other people. <laughs> oh, and Theo and um, I think just Theo. And my uncle. So clap for him, too. <laughs> Thank you.
Next, we have my class, my beautiful class. I love all of you. You're fantastic. Couldn't have done this without you. You're amazing. <laughs> I done the teachers, too. <laughs> All right, do we have any questions for Rudy? Um, hi. hi. <laughs> Hello. Why, so the, the pictures from Hubble, why yeah. do they look like animated? They, animated, they look animated. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. That one. Uh, Hubble's just that good. I don't know uh, what to say. <laughs> cool. And then the other one from 1990 when it took the picture of Saturn, yeah. that just looks like... Oh, well, from 1990, like, this is Earth. Oh, uh, the other one. <laughs> yeah, that one. Ni oh, yeah, 1997. Cool. <laughs> I agree. Yeah. I think I asked you this uh, when I first found out what your topic was. Um, like, you know, if you, like, we're three-dimensional beings and we can sort of invert something like a two-dimensional creature. Like, what would happen if a fourth-dimensional being flipped us around like that? Could you rephrase that question? Like, okay, as three-dimensional beings, we can take a two-dimensional being and, like, invert it, basically, you know? Like, flip it around? Yeah. Oh. Like and that would mm -hmm. it would like you know, transform it in the two dimension, uh, in a way that like a two dimensional being wouldn't really comprehend. So if like a fourth dimensional being were to invert us in that way, like, can you like theorize how that would affect us? I don't really know. I mean, I guess we would be considered four dimensional beings because we live within four dimensions. Um, the fourth is time, so I guess if you like take us inside out, you know, the organs and blood, um, you die. <laughs> it looked pretty gruesome. Okay. Uh, I guess Naya was the like, next person. Oh, uh, you want to go over there first? Yeah, let's just go there. Hi. Hello. <laughs> um, my question is um, anyway, um, you did a really good job. Um, Thank you. And uh, my question is, this is a question about the black hole. Um, do you think our do you think one day our planet will sub be sucked in the, the black hole? Uh, the question was, uh, one day if if what could be sucked one, into a black hole? So, what do you think one day um, in the future? Do you think our planet, our mm -hmm. planet Earth? would be sucked in the black hole? Uh, probably not. Like, um, after three, four billion years, the sun will begin to start dying, and it will expand in that process, uh, killing Earth, like destroying it. So probably not the black hole. Our, our own star will get us first. <laughs> OK. Uh, we can do Naya next. Hi, Rudy. Great presentation. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> my my question to you was, do you think that new data from the James Webb Telescope will shed light on antimatter? And uh, basically, what do we have left to learn about antimatter? And how do you, what sort of developments in scientific understanding do you hope to see regarding antimatter and black holes? I got you. So uh, I actually don't know too much about antimatter. No one does, but like specifically me, not that much. I haven't studied it a lot. But um, the James Webb Telescope is, will definitely provide some sort of insight. We still have lots to learn, especially with the expansion of the universe and dark energy. And um, wait, yeah, so, uh, like a lot to learn, like why it exists or how it exists and like what it is truly. Um, you said once something is caught in the event horizon, that's like the point of no return. But yeah. is is that when 
an object is caught in the black hole's gravitational pull, or is it before that? And then the event hi horizon is like no turning back. So yeah, you're definitely like already getting sucked into the black hole, but like at the event horizon, you're already like right before you're already experiencing the gravity. But like once once you cross the event horizon, you're done for. Like n n no returning. So that that that's more of like the line of no return. But you'll definitely feel the gravitational pull of the black hole well, well before the event horizon. Hey, Rudy. Hello, Mr. Paulson. Um, my question for you is, uh, space is really exciting. It's fascinating, and it I stretches agree. the imagination. Um, but it's, it's out there. So I'm wondering, why do you think humans pursue something that isn't necessarily directly, tangibly, um, connected in like a, a, a palpable way uh, to our everyday lives with our feet on the ground? Well, uh, it's interesting. It's inspiring. It really is, especially with these images. You can see like your world around you, not just world as an Earth, but the entire universe. And also through, like, through exploring space, we can learn more about uh, how Earth was formed, how our sun was formed, and how uh, our galaxy was formed. Now, a galaxy, a galaxy isn't really tangible because we're on Earth, but um, you can learn a lot of the Earth's like, life cycle through uh, observing other planets. Um, hi. hi. Hello. First of all, really good presentation. Thank Very you. interesting. I liked it. Second of all, uh, what is the logic supporting the singularity theory? The logic supporting singularity theory is, is basically like what else would happen um, because as, as it gets more and more dense, it's just going to get more and more dense and then it's hard to imagine a certain cutoff point. So that's where infinite density really comes from where it would just keep on becoming more and more dense infinitely until it dies. Hi, amazing job. Thank My question you. is, do you think Pluto is a planet and why? <laughs> Um, Pluto is not a planet. <laughs> yeah, clap for that one. Clap for that yeah. one, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's too small and too far away to be considered a planet. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Rudy. Great Hello. job. Um, I really enjoyed seeing how well you could put complex um, information into a way to communicate to the whole room um, so that everyone can understand. So I'm curious what you're majoring in in college and if you have considered science communications. Uh, I am currently going to Urbana for liberal arts and sciences undecided. but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, louder, 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 louder. <laughs> uh, I've not considered science communications, but that actually sounds really interesting. I was more so thinking of like research path, but I would, I would definitely consider looking into that. Sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, how was the sun formed? Well, the sun was formed, it was actually formed a long time ago, so, um, a uh, lot of like space dust and gas would uh, come together, and a lot of gas and plasma would come together. And eventually, as it amasses, it would uh, create a larger and larger impact on space time. So it would uh, generate a stronger gravitational force. And then as more matter would come together, it just uh, it began to heat up, it began to produce fusion, and then it began, began to get really hot. And then here we are now. Um, um, first of all, great job. And uh, what makes a planet a planet? That's actually a really good question. Um, a planet, it needs to be a celestial body that orbits a star or a neutron star or black hole. It needs to orbit another body, uh, a supermassive body, n mo normally a star. And um, it's classified by its size and if it has moons mainly. And there are also... Um, like exoplanets that are planets that are like really far away from uh, s like a s like their orbiting object, but they're still orbiting an object, 
and there's uh, and some planets are uh, I forgot the exact name, but they're like deserted planets, so that they're not in orbit of any objects, but they used to be. What would happen if a supernova collided with a black hole? Um, well, assuming that the assuming that the star is still going supernova and it has not produced it yet, the black hole will just like eat all of it. It will consume all the matter and like gain more mass from the black hole. But if the black hole or if the supernova like turns into a black hole like while it is being sucked in. I'm not 100% sure, but it would probably just, uh, it would do the same thing. It would be sucked in by the black hole or by whichever black hole is larger, and the singularities would combine. And uh, like if it turns into like a nebula or like a, or it probably wouldn't get the chance to turn into a nebula, but if it turns into like a neutron star, that would also get sucked in. How about the last question right here? Hi. So uh, two questions. <laughs> One, what exactly is like the Big Bang? Yeah. Oh, so the Big Bang, that whole, I don't know too much about that one, that's more cosmology, but the uh, Big Bang, from what I know, it, it was like uh, all matter and everything was like condensed at like one point and then it exploded and it like went everywhere. And then at the very, like at the early like million, 100,000 years, after the Big Bang, um, primordial black holes started to form. That was when, um, like, uh, molecular clouds, uh, they, they were, since space just recently, ex like, exploded, matter was a lot more condensely packed into what it is now. So black holes would, or, like, stars would begin to form, but they would pick up so much mass so quickly that they would, that, uh, they would actually create black holes because they would attract all the mass in its immediate area, and it would get sucked in so quickly that it would become super dense really quickly. And second question, has a human ever fallen into a black hole? A human has not fallen into a black hole, but if a human were to fall into the black hole, they would die pretty, pretty gruesomely. You seem to know a lot more about the Big Bang than you indicated, Rudy. Thank you, Mr. Rowley. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, that's it. Thank you, Rudy, one more hand. Thank you, Rudy. That was excellent. Thank you for being a great audience. We're going to take a break, and we're going to start at 2 p.m. for our last presentation of day number four. Thank you all.
some of them are, some of the 10th grade are, let's see, here, here they come. All right, we're going to get started. Welcome back, everybody, for our last presentation. Final presentation of the day. And please welcome Mr. Gonzalez to the stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. No, I'm not. That's not fair to say in, a in front of a bunch of seniors who have been doing an amazing job up here. Um, I really appreciate the effort that you've put in. Like any good ghost story, there's always a background that I have to tell. And this is it, about Avila. I met her first when she was transferring into the school. Um, and I met her family. They're very lovely. Uh, all went well because she's here. They're valued members of our community but I do have a little bit of a bone to pick, which is to say there was no hint or warning or foreshadowing of the fact that Avila likes ghosts a lot. And I found this out only when I became her um, senior advisor for uh, this project. And it was maybe junior year, we met out there. Avila, I don't know if you remember this, but um, I came up to you and you're like, hey, Mr. Gonzalez, I hear that you're gonna be my senior project advisor. I didn't know that you did that. And I said, that makes two of us. <laughs> um, I realized that you shouldn't joke with seniors about senior project, they don't really appreciate that. Um, but it was a good partnership. We stood out there trying to figure out how this would go. We were quiet. We were thinking the same thing though because it was a solid partnership. And that same thing that we were thinking was, Avila is going to do all the heavy lifting on this. And she did. And she did a lot of work. She dove into this, did research, um, arranged interviews, wrote edits, gathered artwork. And um, I stood on the sides and asked, like, what can I do to help? She's like, this is what I need. Can you please go to some haunted locations and look for unsettled spirits? And I was like, uh, what else do you have, Avila? I can't do that. Uh, she said, okay, well, there's some case studies based on true events. Um, can you read through those? I was like, mm, I'm gonna have to say no to that. She's like, okay, this is what I need you to do. Can you watch The Conjuring movie, um, one, two, and three, and then get back to me? And I was like, please let me help you in other ways. So we figured that out. I helped her in other ways. Meanwhile, she was doing the work and um, I was doing what I could. This is what I did. I sent her um, stories about how pencils are made, uh, YouTube videos of sand art, uh, exposés on southern cooking, the benefits of project management, Gantt charts, mind maps. And because Avila is the person that she is, she was like, oh, this is great. Thank you so much. So helpful to my presentation. Um, and I joke about that, but it is, in all seriousness, a very uh, solid and worthwhile partnership that I had with Avila. And um, I remain forever grateful for being able to hitch my wagon to that star there. I will miss working with her. Um, she is taking on something that is fundamental and essential to who we are as a school. In the words of uh, Rudolf Steiner, to be able to think one's own thoughts um, is to be free. And that is not merely the thoughts of one's own body or merely the thoughts of the society, but one's own deepest, uh, most essential spiritual thoughts. And that's what we have in this presentation. Um, contrary to... to rumor, this 
presentation has nothing to do with recycling. Um, there was a moment right after um, winter break where Avila came to me and she was like, I can't get my arms around this. I need to change topics. Let's do recycling. And um, this is where I'm going to say you don't joke with senior advisors about things like that. But I didn't flinch. I said, yeah, okay, we can do that if you want to. Um, knowing full well that Avila could, if she wanted to, switch up and deliver a dynamite presentation on recycling. I'm proud of her for sticking with this, figuring out a way in which to make it more real for her, and be able to dwell in the nebulous and the gray and the thing that might not have a conclusion. Um, it is indicative of who she is. Um, my role has always just been a supporting one, where Avila is the hero in her own journey, and we're going to hear about that. I relish the idea of being the person offering the assist, while Avila is the one who is hitting the um, fadeaway jumper over the outstretched arms of a defender while the clock runs down for the win. She is impressive. Please help me welcome to the stage Avila Griffin. All right, hello everyone. <laughs> um, um, so I'm Avila Griffin and my project is Ghost Stories, A Dive Into the Spiritual World. So when I was nine years old, I heard my first ghost story. It was at a sleepover and my friend told me the story behind the, the conjuring. So basically the story goes that in 1849, Bathsheba Sherman killed her son, climbed to the top of a tree, swore fealty to the devil, and then killed herself. <laughs> Sorry. Um, <laughs> then my friend went on to tell me about the Perrin family who moved into this property in 1974. And they experienced sightings of ghosts, they heard noise throughout the house, and they had objects flying across the room. It was so bad that they contacted Ed and Lorraine Warren, a demonologist and a clairvoyant, to come do an exorcism on the house. And after she told me this story, I was terrified, I did not sleep for weeks, and I was all done with ghosts. Um, it wasn't until 2020, um, during COVID, that I was like, I'm going to watch The Conjuring movie by myself, because it was very boring. Um, and I remember, finishing the movie and I was still terrified, but what really freaked me out was the words, based on the true story. <laughs> what do you mean based on the true story? Um, so I started getting like, wait, what parts are real, what parts are not? And that's when I, again, COVID, had a lot of time to look at it. Um, I wanted to look up the real story. Um, so the parent family was real, the house was real, um, and they did experience a spiritual presence within the house. However, I came across an interview where Andrea Perrin, the oldest daughter of the Perrin family, stated that the movie is only 5% true and 95% made up. She goes on to say that the haunting they experienced was not a negative one that was depicted by the Hollywood movie. She states, to be touched by a spirit is not a curse. It's a blessing, a gift, it is that rare and precious glimpse into a realm from which we come and will inevitably return. My mother has no fear of death because of what she experienced at the farm, and neither do I. Of course, I don't want to die in pain, but I definitely don't have any fear of death because I know in some way, shape, or form, we do go on. So this really in kind of sparked like, my interest in the spiritual world. Like I started looking at articles and YouTube videos, and I was just all over it. And this is kind of what inspired me to do a senior project on something around the spiritual world. And humans have always had a fascination with the spiritual world. You can see the earliest forms of ghost stories in Babylonian texts in 2100 BCE. And you can even see it with movies and stories nowadays. 
practices that show, that are based around the spiritual world that show our collective desire to seek understanding of what lies beyond our immediate reality. So that's how I kind of got into doing this for my senior project. And <laughs> this, are, like, this had, I had so many questions. Like, what are ghosts or spirits? Is there a difference? How does spirituality help people? How does it help religions? I had so many questions that just kept taking me in different passes. Um, and it got so bad that I, like Mr. Gonzalez says, within two weeks of senior projects, so when midwinter break, I was like, no, recycling. Um, recycling is so much more straightforward. But there was a part of me that at least wanted to come to you guys, have like a conversation, and talk about what I learned on my journey. And I feel like people don't usually have a conversation about these things. And I just wanted to share what I learned. So as I began thinking about this topic for my senior project, I was um, in my junior year, and we were studying the Song of Solomon by Toni Morrison. So before this book, I knew I wanted to do a project on the spiritual world, but it was more like, why does the place get like haunted? What's the stories behind that? But this book kind of changed my perspective because it showed me an importance of a spiritual world, and I saw that it can help people find protection, connection, and it was all around positive. And I could go on and on about this book and all the stuff I loved about it and all the spiritual aspects to it, but Mr. McCarthy would be really mad because that would last three hours. Um, so the Song of Solomon is based on the African-American folktale about enslaved Africans who escaped slavery by flying back to Africa. The book tells a story about Milkman, who has been alienated from his family, his community, and his historical and cultural roots. And so the person in the book who really changed my perspective was this character, Pilot, his aunt, who was able to help guide him through his journey and understand his family history because of her connection to the spiritual world. And at the end of the book, I love the line from Milkman saying that Pilot was the only one who was able to fly without ever leaving the ground. And that kind of, I kind of see it as she had the same difficulties as people in the book, and but through her connection with the spiritual world, she was able to find a sense of self and have love and guidance for people. So Pilot was also a root worker, which is kind of someone who practice, has like medicines and herbs, and they all get these medicines and herbs from the spirits. So spirits would tell them how to make these. And we had many questions in or conversations in class about how a root worker is kind of tied to the idea of voodoo. So whenever I would like mention voodoo to people or talk about it, um, most of their thoughts would go to dark magic, evil, and especially voodoo dolls. And there are so many misrepresentations of voodoo through Hollywood, like Princess and the Frog and James Bond. The characters who practice voodoo are always seen as the villains and using the practices for, to control people, and it's just not spiritual. Um, and I especially want to talk about the voodoo doll. You can see in Indiana Jones and still Princess and the Frog, these dolls were used to control people. And actually, that practice isn't even a real one in voodoo. Um, the story kind of, there's facts saying that someone walked in on a voodoo priestess doing acupuncture on someone to help them, and he took it as, oh, she's controlling him, and that kind of sparked the voodoo doll. And voodoo is actually, in fact, a very beautiful religion. The belief that is most common came from the descendants of Haiti, and is a blend of various African religions and Christianity. The word voodoo itself means spirit, God, or sacred object. Um, the main teaching of voodoo is that everything is spirit. We are all connected to each other through the spirits and that humans are spirits who inhabit the visible world. And their practice of engaging with the spirits or sacred objects is a way to reinforce cultural identity and strengthen bonds within their community. And voodoo is a practice that has helped many generations of Haitians feel connected with their lost ones. 
when people of Haiti went to New Orleans, they brought the practices along with them and started teaching people of, who were in New Orleans at the time to serve the spirits. Um, and voodoo um, helped people there believe and hope for healing through readings, prayer, rituals, singing, and personal ceremonies. And these ways in connecting with the spirits help people find a sense of self and belonging. And through this sense of self, was able to go out themselves and help others. And when, like, voodoo has shown, um, like, cures in anxiety, addiction, depression, and loneliness. And so what I love about voodoo the most is that they were able to find comfort and direction in challenging times because of their connection with the spirits and their ancestors. And this, in turn, gave them strength to endure um, hardships. And it also did bring them that sense of belonging in a community. They really did see that they were connected to everyone um, and others who were struggling. So I like this photo because you can truly see the connection in the room. So when I first heard that spirits, or they believe that spirits inhabit the visible world, I thought of The Secret of Kells. And this is a beloved movie from my childhood that um, is about a young monk named Brendan and a forest spirit named Ashling, and their kind of journey to finish the Book of Kells. And this movie beautifully depicts the spiritual world as a realm of mystical and supernatural elements that coexist with the physical world. And as a child, I found comfort from the idea that there was a world beyond what we could see. So my love for this movie, and since I'm from Ireland, um, kind of made me want to share more about the ancient Celts and Druids' belief in the spiritual world. So similar to voodoo, they saw in all experiences the presence of spirit. To them, everything had a spiritual essence, like plants, and rocks, the grass, the mountains, everything was spiritual and was connected. Um, the Celts believed that they had a strong connection with these spirits due, their, due to their close relationship with nature. They always remained close to nature in all ways they could, unlike Greece and Rome, who focused on cities and armies. Um, and the Celts had the Druids, who were religious teachers, and leaders among the ancient Celtic people, and they had a very special bond with nature. They saw that human life was but a small fragment of a much larger pattern. Through festivals and prayers and adherence to the Celtic calendar, the Druids were able to bring a sense of protection and connection to their people to help them feel close to the spirits and nature all around them. So this picture is kind of like where the Druids would hold these prayers and kind of festivals. And I wanted to talk about Samhain, which is one of the most important festivals in Celtic culture. And this is on November 1st of our calendar. Um, and this marked the end of the harvest season and the beginning of the darker half of the year. Samhain was a time where the veil between the world of the living and the world of the dead was seen to be at its thinnest, allowing spirits to pass through and be able to have that communication with the ancestors of um, your family. So during Samhain, the Druids played a key role in conducting rituals to honor the ancestors and spirits of the dead. Bonfires were lit, offerings were made, and people dressed in costumes to ward off any appeasing or wandering spirits. And that's how Samhain influenced the modern day um, Halloween on October 31st. And I also wanted to go into more depth of the Secret of Kells. Um, the other main feature I wanted to discuss was the consistent showing of three circles. These are kind of the favorite pictures I got, um, but all throughout the movie, you keep seeing this um, picture of three circles. And the three wheels symbolize the ongoing cycle of life, death, and rebirth, and the eternal connection between all things. It also represents the balance between the light and the dark. They are a consistent reminder that we are a part of a much larger pattern. So this is what also inspired me to do my project outside. Um, this is about the Celtic calendar year, 
and you can see the Celtic calendar has a tie with trees. All the symbols are connected to the trees, and the symbols are called Om, and this was a way for them to connect with nature again. And I did, um, oh, here, right here. I know it's super small. That's Samhain. And I also did um, a serpent kind of eating its own tail in the middle because that's another symbol of kind of an ongoing connected cycle. And one of my favorite things that I just really wanted to share with everyone was the appearance of Plurine Shnata in the movie. And this was an ongoing Celtic belief. Um, these were seen as a sign of the Spirit's blessing, offering protection and hope as the harsh winter gave away to the rejuvenating season of spring. Their pristine white flowers and resilient nature captured the essence and protection and the promise of new beginnings. And I love this because I just feel like I wanted to also share with my class, like there's just protection and new beginnings. And you can, s in the movie, she, Ashling continuously puts these flowers over every part of the forest that they go into, especially the dark parts that help Brandon feel more protected. Um, so what interested me so much about the Celt's belief in the spiritual world was the way um, it was linked and intertwined so heavily with nature, and not just nature, but the seasons. It was through this that I started to have a better understanding of why the spiritual world was so important. And I think this quote sums it up beautifully. So looking at your life in this wider context and being aware of yourself linked to and being a part of a larger pattern or system will bring you enhanced understanding by Liz Murray. And she wrote the Celtic Tree Oracle along with her husband. So by this point, I had so much information and I kind of wanted to have um, an interview with someone just to help kind of guide me through all the questions I had. So um, in the beginning of December, Mr. Gonzalez found me an article about an Evanston Shama and her kind of experience with the connection to the spiritual world. And she agreed to do an interview with me. So a shaman is a spiritual healer found in various indigenous cultures around the world and kind of a modern day Druid, particularly among tribal societies. Shamans are believed to have the ability to communicate with the spiritual world, including spirits of nature, ancestors, and other supernatural entities. They are often thought to be able to enter altered states of consciousness, like trances, um, during which they journey to the spiritual world to gain knowledge, seek guidance, or intercede on behalf of individuals of their community. So again, I really enjoyed my talk with her. She was able to answer so many questions at the time, and she was super sweet. Um, but the main sh thing, or one of the main things she talked about was that um, connecting with the spiritual world didn't have to be hard. It can be in your room or when you are outside, simply being grateful for either the trees, your family, whatever, allowing your heart to be opened up and find a sense of self and belonging. And she was able to also answer one of my very first questions since the beginning, is there a difference between a spirit and a ghost? Um, so she believes that humans are manifestations of spiritual energy and ghosts are manifestations of human energy. While spirits are the souls of humans and other sentient beings like animals who have passed on, ghosts are impressions in space and time. Also, spirits are active and can interact with you if they choose to do so, um, but ghosts seem to be unaware they're ghosts and they don't have consciousness and are unlikely to interact with you. And when I shared this quote with my dad, his dry response was, she clearly hasn't seen Ghostbusters. <laughs> um, thanks, dad. Um, so she really was able to ha help answer the questions I had at the time, and I thought this conversation was perfect because she did have similar beliefs to um, the people who practice voodoo and the beliefs of the Celts. And I decided that I did want to have another conversation. So to leverage my Christian upbringing and because my dad made me, 
I reached out to a close friend of our family, the Episcopal Bishop of Connecticut, the Most Reverend Jeffrey Mello. So talking with Bishop Mello, he said that the religion was how he takes care of his spirituality. He also talked a lot about how faith, a faith without doubt is not a healthy faith. Um, he says that without this connection, you stand to lose responsibility for more than just yourself, and you become all about yourself. Spirituality asks us to be in a relationship without fully understanding it. And the thing I love most about my talk with Jeff was his quote on um, what I was, I asked him a question about like what he thinks spirituality is. And he says that spirituality is like a giant mountain and all the paths up to the top of it is all the different religions and ways we connect with it. And he also helped me to see nowadays it's so easy for us to focus on ourselves and that we forget that spirituality calls us to help other people and help humanity as a whole, the way the root worker, voodoo priestess, druids, and shamans have done for their people. So when I stand back and look at all this information I have gathered, I still feel like I have more questions than answers. Um, it has been a wonderful journey, and I love all of the many beautiful conversations I've had along the way. Um, sharing, a spiritu sharing your spirituality is a way to connect much like a ghost story. It brings people together, building connections, and through that gives us strength and hope. And I also wanted to say that you don't have to believe in the spiritual world to be spiritual. Connecting with something bigger than yourself, be it nature, your culture, all of humanity, or the universe, anything that makes you feel connected will help you through the challenging times of your life. And the best part of this project was definitely the conversations I had. Um, I just, I do love talking about it. And during my conversations and some of the articles that I read, I came across this quote so many times and I wanted to share it with you. So it's, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience, we are spiritual beings having a human experience by Pierre Taylor de Chardon. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I have some thank yous. Um, thank you, Mr. Gonzalez. You always help me feel heard and just thank you for all your meetings and bearing with me through my <laughs> wanting to change, wanting to talk about so many different things and you just always supported it no matter what, which really made me feel confident, so thank you so much. Um, thank you to my parents. Um, you guys are the light in my darkness, so thank you. And I guess my siblings. Um, <laughs> um, thank you to Seamus for saying that you would not have come to my project if I changed it to recycling. Um, <laughs> you really helped me stay um, true to my what I really wanted to talk about. Uh, thank you, Anna, my other brain cell. Thank you for listening to all my rants in our <laughs> January block. Um, thank you. Um, to Mr. McCarthy for reading my really messy, crazy essay and helping me to kind of find my way a bit more. Um, and to Ms. Von Orthel for helping me with my art project um, and being so excited for my senior project. And. I also want to thank my class. Um, just, I love how connected I feel to all of you, and I hope that in your new beginnings, you also feel the protection and just sense of belonging. So, thank you so much. <laughs> All right, questions.
for Avila after this presentation. We'll start here. Okay, first of all, that was so good. It was everything I thought it would be and more. It was really, really, really good. I was so excited for your presentation. It was so good, <laughs> actually. And then, uh, so I wanted to ask, have you uh, felt a spiritual presence ever in your life? And like, was it strong? What was your experience? And besides a New York trip, but. Um, <laughs> I think definitely um, sometimes when I'm like struggling, I would like pray at night and I think that really makes me feel like something's there, like helping me, like God listening. Um, I think I did have a really scary dream uh, like last year kind of where um, this like I saw something and then all of a sudden my closet, my room like fell apart and that really freaked me out and felt like, I don't know, that was weird. Um, but yeah, I think the biggest one is like when I ask something to like help me out through a hard time. Great job, Avila. I kind of <laughs> have like two questions for you. Uh, do you plan on becoming a, a demonologist? And uh, <laughs> when are a group of us going to like a haunted place? Um, <laughs> I, um, I don't plan on becoming a demonologist. Um, I think I want to be a nurse, which is kind of my way to kind of connect and help guide people. Um, but I do really want to go to a haunted location with all of you because that would be super fun. And there's so many in Chicago. Hi, Avila. Um, back oh. here. Uh, I think the, I just want to say, I think the greatest gift of the way that you present this topic is the, um, the, the fact that you're presenting um, a pluralism of views of spirituality, experiences of spirituality, and you really do, you, you have treated every single manifestation of human spirituality with equal reverence. Um, and it's just, it's so refreshing to, to get that. And um, considering that, I'm wondering um, what your thoughts are on um, the, the role that the role that particular um, particularly defined religions play within that because you know it is it, well it is possible and it seems you know it's wonderful to be able to honor all belief systems equally um, how do you think people come to stick with a particular religion and what does the kind of the level of faith that can in can at times be exclusionary of other faiths play in the, I don't know, the, wi the wider picture of how different um, human beings all are and the way they come to and interact with the spirituality? Sorry, that was a mouthful. <laughs> um, that's a good question. Um, I think um, it's really like up to you. I mean, I've seen so many different religions and I think it really is just which one allows you to find that connection and kind of sense of self. Um, and I think it's like, which one allows you to kind of look outward the most? Um, and I feel like definitely people, like if their family cho like has a religion, you want to stay connected to your family. So that's the religion you also want to follow. And I think, yeah, there's just so many. So it's really just kind of that connection that I found was such a big part of my project. Um, whichever one kind of you feel that belonging with people. Avila, great job. You did oh, amazing. You. Uh, what's your favorite scary movie? Mm, I'd definitely say, um, I think the Conjuring movies, even though they're super intense, I think they've just like, um, kind of, they were a starting point, so they were fun. And I've had lots of like, you know, movie nights with friends watching them. So again, that like connection aspect, it's been fun. Uh, can you tell us a bit about your own spiritual beliefs? Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so it's, um, I do believe in God, but I think I also believe in connecting with, like, spirits of people who have passed, and especially, like, your family or something like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, like, kind of... I definitely believe in God and all that. <laughs> Hi. 
Hi. Um, I've heard um, there's like people who can talk to um, people from the spiritual world called mm -hmm. mediums. Oh yeah. Do you, um, if you want to, um, if you're gonna, do you want to be a medium when you grow up? <laughs> or do you just want to be like a, a, like a connecting person um, mm. um, around um, the world maybe? Yeah. Or um, do oh. you, sorry. Oh no, it's okay. Uh, or, or do you um, just want to be just, in your home and just pray, <laughs> praying um, with other people, with spirits, um, and to God? Um, yeah, so I feel a, m a medium um, is more someone who is like given a gift of being kind of clairvoyant and can um, kind of see things that we can't. Um, and I don't think I got that gift, so <laughs> definitely not a medium. Um, and I just think uh, where I kind of find connection and stuff is definitely just at home um, with prayers or my family, friends, and yeah. But I love learning about all the different things people believe in all around the world, so I'd love to travel and hear the different stories. Hi, Avila. Hello. Great job. I really enjoyed it. Um, so you talked a little bit about this Celtic tradition of like or on November 1st, how it's like a time to connect with the dead and people who have passed mm -hmm. on. Did you look at all into this connection like across the world where like there's Day of the Dead where it's the same idea around the same time of year and how these different cultures sort of arrived at the same traditions? Yeah, um, it's really interesting because I feel like you do see that in a few of the religions, especially I researched, like there are like really, there are certain beliefs that are so similar. And I think um, I didn't, like when I first was reading about um, like Samhain and stuff, um, I mean, I kind of grew up knowing what it was, but when I was getting the facts and stuff, I did have that, oh, that reminds me of Day of the Dead. And I couldn't really find a connection between the two, but um, yeah, it is interesting when you read about all the different religions, you do find like the little things like that that are similar, that's really cool. Hi, Avila. Congratulations, that was an amazing presentation. And I just wanna give you a shout out, because I know <laughs> when you first came to this school and when we were, um, doing the admissions process. I know you were worried about this and you really killed it, so well done. Thank you. Um, so as you mentioned, you uh, have a big Irish heritage. Um, when you go to Ireland, do you feel any greater sense of the spiritual world? Um, I would say yes. I mean, whenever we go over, I. I feel like even though I didn't get to know my um, grandmother that well, um, she passed when I was three, I just, I don't know, whenever people talk about Ireland or when we go there, I just feel like she's always there, and I feel like that's like, yeah, whenever we go there, I just always have the strongest feeling of her and my like grandfather, um, and just kind of that rem memory of her. I still have like, I know I was three, but I still have like very vivid, kind of scenes with her, and I just feel like there was a bond there that I really feel when I go back. We have time for one more question, if there is one. You have a question. <laughs> oh. is there one more? Well, this one, oh, is it? No, no. well, I just wanted to ask, maybe did you find in studying all the different religions that you got to, you know, kind of um, research, did you find that there were more similarities than differences? Yeah, I actually found there were so many similarities between some, and I think that's what's so cool and what I did want to share with everyone. Like, I think any way we um, believe we're all connected in some way. So I'm going to put you on the spot, unfortunately. 
So I'm going to test your Irish. So plurini schnachter, what does that mean? Snowdrop flowers. Well done. And Celtic mythology was very big, or, or what was kind of the osmosis to Christianity coming to Ireland. You, you mentioned the three circles that were used. Um, how was that used then by the, you know, the Catholic or, or the Christian faith to teach uh, religion in Ireland? Oh, thank you for such a great question. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so you can see um, a lot in <laughs> the three circles um, was then used by St. Patrick, kind of. He also used nature, the um, shamrock, and he showed the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, um, the divinity, and he kind of tied both worlds together, and that's how there is Christianity in Ireland. So thank you, Dad. Go reveal them all good. <laughs> Did you think about the connection um, doing the Garden of Light? I don't know if that's the spiral that you do in, the, in December in the, in the Waldorf schools, because so much of what you talked about were the spirals yeah. and the circles. Um, oh, that was so cool. Yeah, this year um, we did kind of a walk, and it was a spiral. And um, I really like the spirals, because I think that really does just tie in the whole idea that we're all together flowing. Um, yeah, that's why I love the picture that I showed so much is the spiral. Um, yeah, I, f I honestly forgot about that. Thank you for reminding me. I love that. Good. Thank you so much, Avila. Thank you. Before we let you all go and enjoy hopefully a dry afternoon <laughs> in comparison of this morning, thank you so much for the great four presentations of today. Thank you for being a great audience. Yes. And thank you for everyone that is watching from other places. So please, um, we welcome you back tomorrow. We start at 10 a.m. And for seniors, we will be meeting here at 9.30 here in the auditorium, so be sure to be, be on time, 9.30. And we will hear from the two last seniors that we are still missing to hear from, Nick Solano and Aaron Gaffar. So, thank you everyone, have a great afternoon, bye-bye. <laughs>